Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. So before I start my talk, for those of you who were blissfully asleep last night, um, there was a Newton star black hole merger, pretty well localized and pretty nearby, or 180 megaparsecs. Uh, so everyone is now looking for the counterpart. So if you see sleepless people around here or people in the back on their laptops, it's not personal. Um, so I'm involved in several efforts. This is uh, the localization region. This is a few galaxies that we targeted with Las Cumbres Observatory that is based here in Santa Barbara. Um, and then also these are some DECAM pointings that happened uh, in the area. And this is uh, black gem pointings. And you might wonder, why are they in the circumference of the area? Um, so this is actually due to a bug uh, in the system, uh, which is uh, being fixed. Um, but uh, they found it, thank, so what you're seeing here are images, screenshots from the treasure map, which is an interface we developed so that uh, different groups can coordinate their observing strategy. So it, if we ignore for a second that this was not intentional, this is actually looks like people are dividing the area amongst themselves. But thanks to this visualization, Black Jim realized they have a problem. Okay, they didn't know it before. Okay, so this is... Uh, happening now, and of course, we'll let you know if we find the counterpart, but this is pretty low galactic latitude, so there's a lot of extinction, and also it's full moon today, so this is not great. Uh, but we'll see, it's the best candidate in four years, okay, so hopefully we find something. And yesterday uh, was Passover Eve, okay, so today is Passover, so uh, I at least am calling it the matzo ball merger, okay. <laughs> uh, so help me distribute this name, okay. So I was asked to talk about observations of TDEs, which is a very vague and general title, so I'm not sure I'm going to hit what the organizers want me to, but I'm going to try to just take a step back a bit from the talks we had in the morning session and give a little bit of an overview, and I will uh, emphasize some uh, puzzles that I think might be interesting to discuss this week and in the following weeks in the program. Okay, so of course we have the main class of optical UV TDEs, characterized by uh, pretty high luminosity, so it, it's a broad spread. Um, persistent blue colors, this is a great way to distinguish them uh, from other transients. And broad hydrogen and or helium and or other higher energy lines seen in the spectra. Um, so the biggest puzzle I think about this class, we now have dozens of events, several dozens of events, is still though, why are they emitting in the optical in UV? Um, and we know this can't be direct accretion because it doesn't fit the temperatures, the radii, the temperature evolution, not even the total energy, um, and we definitely don't understand the spectral features uh, yet. So um, as you all know, there are other emission uh, processes that could uh, uh, cause this, so reprocessed emission from the accretion disk um, or outer shock. So we'll just say a few things about this. So reprocessed emission was shown already a while ago by Nathan Roth that it can explain um, the radii that we see, the temperatures that we see, and even the spectral features where the high H alpha is turned on and off depending on the radius of this reprocessing emission. And what's very nice is that recently there is actually observational evidence. This is black body radius on the x-axis versus H alpha luminosity um, on the y-axis, and you see that indeed, as Nathan predicted in 2016, the larger the black body radius, the photosphere, the stronger the H-alpha emission is, and this is basically if you're closer to the ionizing source, much of your hydrogen is ionized, and you won't see a line. If you're further away, you'll see a stronger line. So this is a very nice, uh, consistent picture. Um, and I think later today, Jane, uh, who's here, will probably talk about her unification picture, that this could actually be a viewing angle effect uh, we have reprocessing material at certain viewing angles, and we can see the disk directly at other viewing angles, and a great way to test this is with polarization that we'll also hear about from Yanis later today. Okay, so this is the reprocessing accretion disk picture. Okay, but there is a, the competing model, um, which stemmed out of the fact that numerical simulations showed that the uh, nozzle shock, the shock that happens at pericenter there very briefly, is not enough, at least in these simulations, to dissipate energy to circularize the debris. Um, and in fact, in order to dissipate that energy, you have to wait for another pass and then for the streams to collide between themselves, and then you get shocks in apocenter, way out there, so this is why they're called outer shocks, 
And those shocks not only dissipate the energy you need to dissipate in order to circularize and accrete, but they also, uh, if you calculate what kind of, how this energy is being dissipated, uh, it turns out that it, it dissipates energy in the temperatures radii that we see in optical UVTDs. So could we be seeing not the accretion, but the formation of the accretion disk before it's formed through these outer shocks? Uh, recently, there were new simulations published this year, just a couple of months ago, um, by Steinberg and Stone, uh, showing, okay, so you're seeing density on the left. These are a few snapshots of a disruption. This is a solar mass star with a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole, so this is very advanced um, that we can do a solar mass, uh, you know, realistic parameters. And on the right, you're seeing energy dissipation. So one new thing out of this here is that there is energy being dissipated in the nozzle shock, uh, which wasn't seen in previous simulations. So this means you can dissipate some of the energy in the nozzle shock and start circularizing, but it's not enough. It then sets some kind of chain reaction where the, the debris collide with themselves, like in the second picture, but not at apocenter, not that far out. It's not complete outer shocks, it's further in. And then this dissipates more energy, which causes more collisions, it dissipates more energy, and it circularizes uh, within a few weeks. Um, and so one observational prediction of this, this simulation has only been run up to peak luminosity, but one observational prediction is that the energy dissipation at the nozzle shock should cause an X-ray uh, flare. And then about two weeks later, you should start seeing the optical flare um, from the stream, disk stream collisions, I think they call it. Um, so uh, this is very hard to see observationally an X-ray flare two weeks before the optical flare because we usually are not that good at catching them, but there is one event, AT2022 DSB, where there was an X-ray flare up there in the upper panel two weeks before the peak of optical luminosity, exactly as this simulation predicted. So now we have a fourth uh, model, which is kind of uh, in between the previous two of stream disk collisions. Clement, I'm sorry, I, I didn't have the original graphics, so I did it really in a very bad way, but this is kind of just to illustrate. Um, what is happening. And nature probably always, as always, doesn't pick just one of these things. There could be a combination of mechanisms going on, and we see evidence of this in structure in the light curve. So this is 2018 FYK, where you see multiple peaks in the optical and then the X-ray, which is the triangles, uh, shooting up later. And there's also spectroscopic evidence here that what we're seeing in the optical before the X-ray shot up was reprocessed emission through iron lines in the spectrum. Um, but it could be that maybe some of that is being contributed by the outer shocks, and then later we're seeing the accretion disk. Uh, so we could be seeing both of them. Another famous example, Assassin 15LH, um, which some of us think is a tidal disruption event around a rapidly spinning black hole where you, the time scales for these two things, the accretion and the outer shock, get separated, and you kind of see this perhaps in the light curve. Um, Adele's favorite TD, 2019 AZH, a very good candidate for favorite TD. This is work by graduate student in my group, Sarah Faris. Uh, we combined published data uh, by Hinkel et al. and additional data from us. And so this accidentally gave us very high cadence observations of a TD, uh, one of the few ones, because you know we thought there's no point in observing a TD every night. It doesn't change that fast. Nothing interesting is happening. But when we got it by accident, we noticed actually maybe, maybe there are interesting things happening. So you see in the inset on the upper right, kind of two arrows there. The top arrow is pointing at a change in slope in the rise, and the bottom arrow is pointing at these bumps in the rise that uh, you can see compared to the line, which is just extrapolation from, from the peak. Uh, there's some structure in this early light curve. It's very subtle, but you see it in all bands. And we hadn't seen this uh, much before because we hadn't been observing it TDs of these high cadence. Uh, this paper was just accepted. If the referee is in the room, thank you. Um, so this is what happens when you observe TDs at very high cadence. You start to see interesting things, um, also spectroscopically, which I'll get to in a second. So the bottom line is there's a lot of structure in the light curves when you look closely. Now that we have many well-observed events, um, I think this is one of the best observed. And this structure might be telling us something about the interplay between the different emission mechanisms uh, that the theorists have come up with. Um, okay, another, I think, interesting puzzle, and this was mentioned, is the late-time UV plateaus. Uh, Short showed this a while ago. Uh, there's new evidence for this. Late-time UV plateaus, maybe this could be a lingering accretion disk um, or cooling envelope uh, uh, happening as well. 
Another recent discovery, which I think is very interesting, and I hope we get to talk about uh, during this meeting and program, are multiple peaks um, in TDs. So the top one is 2020 VDQ. Um, this had a peak and then nothing for a couple of years, and then a second flare at the same position. Uh, for that one, the second flare was about 10 times brighter than the first one. Uh, and so one option is that uh, discussed in that paper is that uh, the first one uh, was a binary that was tidally disrupted. Uh, one, of the one of the stars is ejected and the other one comes back to then get disrupted by itself. Uh, and this is, might be what is causing this um, double TDE. But there's a new one now. Uh, this is work by former postdoc in my group, Lydia Macrigiani, AT2022 DBL. Okay, so it had to be a double TDE. We um, uh, actually, uh, it is a very typical optical UV TDE, okay? So much so that we didn't even know what title to give the paper when we just had the first peak because it was just completely ordinary uh, hydrogen and helium TDE. And then uh, the name did not disappoint and recently it had a second flare. Uh, what's interesting about this one is the second flare is almost identical to the first one, okay? So whatever happened here, it has to be repeatable Almost exactly, this is the R-band first peak versus second peak. Uh, this is the black body first peak versus second peak. Uh, identical temperature, identical light curve, uh, brightness and shape. And even the spectroscopically, it's pretty very similar. H-alpha luminosity first peak versus second peak. Um, so it's all very preliminary. The second peak is still ongoing. But if you have an explanation for how a TDE can happen twice, you have to explain for this event how it can happen twice and look the same both times. And both times look like a classical textbook TDE. Okay, there's nothing weird about each peak except the fact that it happened twice. Okay. Um, then there are even more repeating cases. Um, this one, uh, Assassin 14KO, very interesting repeating cases. And there are more, and we'll, uh, by DJ Pasham as well. And I think on Friday, we'll have several talks about these repeating uh, cases, so I won't say more about that. Um, okay. Another interesting front, I think, is the infrared observations. Uh, so again, pioneered by Short with archival data. Uh, one of the more recent cases, published by Megan Newsom, who's a graduate student here at Las Cumbres, um, where she sees uh, excess infrared emission compared to what you expect if you compare to a TD template light curve. And in addition, there's a bump at about 100 days uh, in the infrared. And so if these are dust echoes, the 100-day time scale is probing sub-parsec scales around the supermassive black hole, which is very exciting. And we'll hear more about infrared TDs from a different Megan, Megan Masterson, who will be talking later about infrared TDs. So pay attention to that. And note there are two Megans working on infrared TDs. Okay? And they're both here, so don't get confused like I always do. Okay. Okay, another interesting front, I think, is um, the spectral evolution. So you're seeing on the left um, the uh, continuum emission and the spectral lines, and you're seeing that the luminosity in the spectral lines is, is delayed, is tracing the continuum emission with a delay. In different events, it's different delay. Sometimes there's zero delay, but sometimes there's up to 45 day time delay between the continuum and the line emission. So this is a very interesting clue about where the line emission is coming from. Um, but it varies. It's, not a, it's, not, it's very different between different events. Uh, so that's on the left, these time delays. And on the right, you're seeing the evolution of the H-alpha luminosity on the top, uh, full with half max, and offset of the central wavelength of the, the emission line at the bottom. Uh, the black squares are our favorite TD 2019 AZH, which was caught very early. So you can see it's the only one where you see the real rise in the H-alpha uh, luminosity at the top. But also it was caught early enough that there's something very strange happening at the early times with the offset. We have two independent different instrument spectra showing the H-alpha line exactly where it should be. And then immediately it's blue shifted and then it slowly comes back. Uh, so again, this morphology in the lines that we can now study Better. So I think this puzzle of what is causing them to emit, how they emit, we can now uh, sub-classify uh, into different questions. What is causing the light curve structures we see, the multiple peaks, uh, the UV plateaus, the infrared excess, and the emission line delays and their evolution. So I think this is a, okay, it's a big puzzle, but I think it would be great to discuss this during the meeting. Second favorite puzzle of mine is the host galaxies. Uh, so as most of you know, TDs tend to like post-starburst or E plus A galaxies. 
uh, down here in this bottom corner of the of face space. Uh, it's one of my favorite plots of all time, actually. Um, uh, so what could be causing this, okay? Why do they prefer post-starburst hosts? Uh, there are many ideas I will mention. The first one, which was kind of the most popular, is that these galaxies have a higher density of stars in the nuclei. Um, this is work by Decker uh, with HST data of TD hosts showing that indeed uh, there is some uh, enhanced densities in the nuclei of these galaxies. It doesn't quite go high resolution, even though it's HST. It's the best we could do for TD hosts. It doesn't quite probe the real very center. But I would say I was a big fan of this explanation until this recent work um, from last year showing that actually, if you increase the density of stars in the center of galaxy, that should decrease the rate of TDEs. So what you're seeing here is the rate of TDE as a function of black hole mass. Um, and as you add, as you make the density profile of the center of the galaxy steeper, you actually get a lower rate. And the reason this is when you have a higher density gradient, you have more stars in the center, you have a higher probability of strong interaction, strong scattering between stars. Um, and this actually decreases the rate of TDE because it, it uh, takes stars away from the loss cone. Um, and so I think this very interesting result that actually says, okay, now not only do we have to explain why TDEs prefer post-starburst, to explain why they prefer them despite this effect that post-starbursts have uh, higher density in the nucleus, okay. So again, this puzzle, and we'll hear talks about Anne, from Anne Decker um, and Erica uh, on this conference about this puzzle, so I'm really looking forward to that. I'll take my last few minutes just to talk about things that are not the uh, main class of optical UV TDEs. Um, this was an event, this is assassin data about an event that there was nothing, 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 and then it suddenly rose and it never came back down. Um, or came back down very slowly. So you're seeing in gray a typical TDE, but this thing came back down very slowly. Um, and spectroscopically had bone fluorescence lines. These are the bottom spectra here. They are much narrower lines than in the typical TDE class. Okay, so we think it's something distinct. We call them bone fluorescence flares or BFFs. Um, and their uh, characteristics are uh, these bone lines, the bone mechanism I can talk about later if you want. Um, much narrower than in uh, the other TDs. They go up, but then they really go down much slower. And this event uh, uh, was the first one of those found in a galaxy we knew was an AGN before the flare. So we think maybe this class is tied to existing AGN disks, something going on there um, that makes this class different from the main class of TDs. And this one also had a second bump uh, a few hundred days later. Okay. And actually, if you look at them, they might all have second bumps. Uh, depending on the coverage, this might be a, a common thing for this class of events. So what is the nature of these things? I think it's another interesting puzzle. Um, quick minute about this one very peculiar event. This was an AGN, bottom spectrum, narrow line AGN, and then it had a flare, and it emerged from that flare with broad lines. So this is a changing look AGN. First time it was caught in the act. We knew AGN changed from narrow line to broad line, but we never saw it happen in real time. And this change was accompanied by a flare that kind of is similar to a TD light curve in the optical. In the X-ray, it did the opposite, actually declined in the X-ray and came back while having a lot of variability seen by NICER. Um, and you see in the top panel the H out for the broad lines emerging. So this, this is a very strange event, uh, still ongoing and doing strange things. Uh, TD like light curve, but it's changing look AGN while the X-ray goes down and up. Uh, there are many papers on this event. Okay. Um, so our TD is related to changing look AGN, another question. Okay, so just take the last minute to say, okay, so many interesting challenges, how do we find more events? Uh, quick work by graduate students in my group, uh, Yael Ghani, showing what happens if you try to classify everything optical surveys find in the center of galaxies. Turns out only 2.2% are TDs. Um, so this is hard, okay. Everything else is supernovae, basically, and most of them are type 1A supernovae. Even if you look at only blue events, okay, you get double the rate of TDs, but it's still 4%. If you look in post-starburst galaxies, okay, now we're talking, but there are very few such galaxies that we know of, so the total number of events is small. So how I, can I think, how I think we can overcome this? Wait a couple years, Ultrasat is going to be a wide field uh, UV survey uh, that is going to observe in the UV band over there where the typical temperature of TDs, 20 to 30,000 Kelvin, is much easier to see 
than to discern from other temperatures than in the optical. This is a quantification of that statement, but I don't have time to go into it because I prefer to show the rates. CD rates expected to be found by ultrasat. Uh, what, it doesn't matter which uh, plot you look at. Uh, it's hundreds or thousands of events per year in the UV, and it'll be easy to tell them apart from the type 1A supernovae because this will be in the UV. Okay. So I'll just summarize. Many interesting challenges, I think. What is, what is the emission mechanism of ultraviolet uh, optical TDs, and what, how does this explain all the features we're starting to unravel? What are Bowen's fluorescence flares? Uh, are changing look agents related to TDs? Uh, and then these things are hard to find. Uh, they are rare, and there's a lot of contamination in galaxy centers. Uh, but hopefully we can revolutionize this with Ultrasat, which is expected to launch in 2027. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> ah. yeah. Go ahead. Will Ultrasat's cadence enable it to discover repeating sources like the ones you showed examples of? Yes, so ultrasat cadence is still being determined, but the idea is that there will be one field that ultrasat observed most of the time with five minute cadence for years. Um, but for TDs, that's not, not exactly, well, maybe there'll be surprises. Uh, but then for uh, some percent of the time, it'll be either once a day or once every few days. And then, yeah, if we keep hitting those fields, the same fields for years, which now we know to look for, we should see the multiple peak ones. Thanks. Hi, great talk. Uh, so this is a somewhat, I don't know, hypothetical question, but for the repeating TDEs, do you have any thoughts on how to distinguish when you have, say, just two flares between an actual repeating, like partial TDE or something, and just two independent TDEs in the same galaxy? Yeah, okay, so I would say just by chance, it's very unlikely to have two independent TDEs in the same galaxy, right? The rate is supposed to be one every 10,000, 100,000 years. So if you get two separated by two years apart, I would be very suspicious if that's by chance. But also for this one, 2022 double, uh, it looks identical to the first one. So I'd say that's, you know, it's a double tooth fairy. It has to be related somehow. Thank you. Any other questions? I just wanted to say, so we do know that QPEs also repeat and they also look almost identical. So it's not out of this world that TDEs might do something that they would also look very similar multiple times in a row. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah, so the Bowen fluorescence flares, you show one event where we know that there is a pre-existing agent there. Do you know if there are any Bowen fluorescence flares that's in quiescent galaxy, but they do appear with narrow Bowen lines? Yeah, so all of the other Bowen fluorescence flares were in galaxies that we couldn't tell if it was in pre-existing AGN or not. There wasn't enough archival data. So also this one, the AGN wasn't very active. So even if you look just at the history of the light curve, you wouldn't know it's an AGN, but there happened to be an archival spectrum oh. that showed that that galaxy was an AGN. So for the other ones, they could be, you know, very low activity AGN and we just wouldn't know. Um, so, you know, this is one case where say, are all of them, were all of them in these pre-existing AGNs or not? We can't tell. But these weren't, even this one wasn't an AGN, it would have been obvious if there weren't that archival spectrum. I see, thanks. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, so uh, for the post-starburst overrepresentation of TDEs and post-starburst and E plus A galaxies, my uh, sort of personal favorite take on it is that those are merger triggered mm -hmm. uh, starbursts. I was wondering, since like the new, new results came out about the high nuclear concentrations, um, I was wondering what your favorite model is now. Um, <laughs> well, I should say from the beginning, I like the idea of these are supermassive black hole binaries. But people shot that down because they said the rates don't work out. But maybe we'll have to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, I don't know. And there are bigger experts than me in the audience to answer that question. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Uh, is there a lot of literature relating changing looks to TDEs, or is that a relatively recent? No, this is a, okay, I should say, thank you for the question. This is a <laughs> wild, uh, completely wild guess. Um, that TDs might be related to changing look AGN. Just because we caught one that happened to have a flare that looked like a TD flare, but spectroscopically it looked nothing like a TD. I should say TDs should happen in AGN, right? There's no reason they shouldn't. And when they do, it won't look like just a TD plus an AGN, because the whole process is very different. The star could collide with the accretion disk. 
stop the accretion for a while and then, you know, it's a very complex process and they're just now beginning to have, you know, we're having simulations of these things. So no one knows exactly what it would look like and if it would cause a change in look or not. The one thing we can say for sure in this one event, one of the ideas of why AGN changed look was that this is an obscuration effect and, the, you know, a few year time scale the obscuration moves out of the way and now you see the broad lines that you didn't see before. Uh, but this happened much faster than that. So at least for this case, that can't be the explanation. So maybe a TD was involved here. We don't know. Hey, I, yeah, thanks for the great talk. Lots of interesting things. I was curious about the, the I-band XS. That's for like, uh, MOT, right? Yes, yes, uh, MOT. And you had the little bump, and that, does that, mat that matches also the bump in the NeoWise data or it's on shorter time scales? Megan, right behind you, can answer that question better than me. <laughs> but walk up to the microphone, Megan. I'll put up the plot in the meantime. There is a wise uh, access as well. Uh, it's at, um, you know, it's a six month cadus, so it sees it later, but it is there. And then, and then it has to be very hot, I guess, to, to for all of that to be infrared emission. So that would be really exciting because we, yeah, we, we haven't seen that often. In some cases, but we've seen it with CTF, but we're not sure if, if it's real. But yeah, this, this would be uh, really hot dust, so that, that's really exciting. We use your dust model to find the temperature, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and I would say this convinced me that we should be observing optical UVTDs in the infrared, which we kind of, I think, at least some of us neglected uh, to do so, you know, we didn't think we'd need to observe them at high cadence. Turns out we do. We didn't think anything interesting was happening in the infrared. Turns out it is, so, yeah. So can we say anything about the rates of these repeating TDs? Mm. So I th oh, we're, I'm, we're working on that literally as we speak. <laughs> um, we're looking into all past TDs to see now how many of them repeated or not. So far, I can say it's a very preliminary search that we've been doing. Um, we haven't seen anything as obvious as these two in the previous TDs using, you know, archival atlas and, HS and ZTF data that now exists for years. We haven't seen any very significant second peaks, but this is very preliminary. Some of them have hints of maybe something, but it doesn't, at least on a few year time scale, it doesn't seem to be that all of them do this, maybe probably even not most of them, but I hopefully in a few weeks I can give you a better answer. Okay, and maybe a follow-up is for the uh, double system that you showed. Uh, what is the accreted mass or what's the you know, energy budget for each of these flares? Mm, I don't have the numbers on me. I can check the paper draft, but these are pretty standard TD light curve luminosities, time scales, temperatures. Really, it was such a boring TDE before the second peak, we didn't know what to, how to publish this. Um, so it is really a, a typical TDE in terms of its parameters. So whatever model you like for typical TDEs, those are the parameters for this one. Okay, any other questions? Can we expect transient alerts from Ultrasat? How, do, how will that work? I hope so, yes. The idea is that Ultrasat alerts will be public. Follow-up data will then not, will be proprietary to the collaboration, uh, but uh, alerts should be public, definitely, yes. And yeah, if you want to get involved with Ultrasat, uh, let me know. Currently, the politics are, it's an Israeli-led mission, uh, but there, NASA's providing the launch, so there are a few, there's, I think, 13 U.S. Uh, uh, investigators involved. Aaron, you're one of them. Uh, so you also talk to Aaron. Uh, and this will change every few years. Um, uh, there will be other calls for U.S. investigators to join. Okay, let's thank Yair again. Thank you.